Dhamma Emperor and his stupa. Since prehistory, various cultures have created art out of stone. Stone is hard, powerful, long-lasting. Masonry has been a respected skill across all civilizations, and we can see the highest artistic unity of nature and humanity in rock-cut architecture, structures excavated and built directly into solid rock. Within these man-made caverns, artists and masons set about carving and painting some of the most intricate and difficult artwork the world has ever seen. Buddhism has contributed immensely to India's tradition of masonry. For more than two and a half millennia, Buddhist monks and nuns sought refuge to live and practice. They found the ultimate answer in stone caves, massive landmarks with imposing interiors that invoked a sense of the holy and tranquil. But in exploring this period of Buddhist prehistory, we must begin our journey with the most basic kind of Buddhist landmark. The great stupa of Sangchi is one of the earliest and oldest specimens of Buddhist rock-cut architecture. The stupa is a signature Buddhist structure devoted to the Buddha's relics. Its ancient pedigree is indisputable. Its function was to serve as the very first reliquary for the Buddha's relics after his death. Originally, a funerary mound, the stupa has since become a signature Buddhist structure. Its reach for the sky evolving into the famous pagodas of East Asia and the Chorten in Tibet. It is the embodiment of the Buddha's presence in this world, a repository of his wisdom and compassion. Once lost to the wild jungles after millennia of Hindu and Muslim domination, it was restored between 1912 and 1919 under Sir John Marshall. Since the 3rd century BCE, the great stupa at Sangchi, Madhya Pradesh, has held the keys to some of Buddhism's most enchanting secrets. Its creator is second in fame only to Gandhi or Nehru in the pantheon of Indian leaders. He was Ashoka the Great, ruler of the Mauryan Empire. Much of what we know about Ashoka comes from the so-called rock edicts, epigraphic inscriptions that he had carved on pillars and rocks throughout the empire. Soon, he was erecting stupas all over his empire to demonstrate his newfound piety. He is said to establish the original site at Sangchi after marveling at the scenic tranquility and admiring the view from the hill on which the stupa now stands. The great stupa during his era was simply a low structure of brick, half the diameter of the present construction. There was little of the grandeur and ornamentation that have come to characterize this magnificent crypt. But now look at it. Look upon its Mauryan glory, upon which successor after successor has added new art upon the original wonder. No art historian or critic can fail to be stunned into reverent silence here. Thanks to the dynasties and monarchies that came after Ashoka, cosmic meaning adorns every inch of the stone. We can even more or less tell when many of the pieces were initiated. We have the Sunga emperors in the 2nd century BCE to thank for the somber stone slabs and the exquisite railing. Just look at the hemispheric dome, about 36 meters in diameter and 16 meters high. It is crowned with a triad of royal parasols dedicated to the three treasures of the Buddha, his teachings and the institution he imparted to the world, the Buddha Sangha. What about these intricate, immense gateways built during the Satavahana era? They possess a unique sensuality unique to the period, detailing the miracles and events from the Buddha's many lives. This elaborate art was not simply to make the stupa look good or boast of the emperor's generosity. It was to communicate a message to a mostly illiterate populace. These sculptures offer artistic narrative to people who never picked up parchment or birch bark. The carvings on these gates depict events from the Buddha's past lives and final rebirth. We know that the great stupa hails from a time before the Buddha statues that still sit near the gates because in all gates friezes, the Buddha is depicted as simply a tree or a stupa. This is the fabled anachronism of Buddhist art, a time when the Buddha was only represented by symbols before the revolution of Gandharan and Mathuran art. These symbols at the great stupa mainly consist of the lotus flower or an elephant marking his birth, 
a body tree to represent his enlightenment, a wheel signifying his teachings, and a stupa to denote his enduring presence on earth. Few other stupas possessed this staircase and the extraordinary circular platform, which was designed for the religious practice called circumambulation. This is a long word for a simple ritual, which simply means to walk around a sacred object in a clockwise direction. What an experience it must have been for the first pilgrims to raise their heads and bask in the glory of the stupa. Be they aristocrat or commoner, there is no doubt that they would have felt a great sense of wonderment as well as heartfelt, profound reassurance that the Blessed One would always remain with them in this world of suffering. Some scholars have wondered whether Ashoka was truly as sincere towards Buddhism as believers think. Like any good king, Ashoka had to express support for the religions of his empire, and his edicts focused on universal themes everyone accepted. So, was Ashoka the great the Buddhist he claimed to be, or not? Are the foundations of the great stupa built upon a lie? While it is true that we shouldn't exaggerate his enthusiasm, there is strong evidence in the proclamations that he took his Buddhist identity seriously. If nothing else, from all the imperial stonework that survives the Mauryan period, we know that unlike other monarchs of the ancient world, Ashoka did not want to be remembered as a mighty conqueror, but as a great man who had repented of conquest by violence. His rocky dicks and the great stupa are testaments to this desire, not monuments to military victory, but to personal spiritual reform. Art might sometimes distort or our understanding of the past, but you can guarantee that it is never insincere.